Fire Television. Kern County In-Depth with 17's Jim Scott. Welcome. Good to have you with us here for Kern County In-Depth. I'm Olivia LaVoyce in for Jim Scott this weekend. Today we'll be discussing cold cases. It's a topic we're passionate about here at Channel 17. And earlier this year, for the first time ever, the Bakersfield Police Department formed a cold case unit. This news was especially exciting when we found out the first case the team was tackling is the murder of Kathleen Heisey, a case we've covered extensively at 17. Take a look. It's an exceptionally daunting task. I mean, it's an extensive process. Homicide detectives up against stacks of cold cases. It's a critical need. There's no way that we could uh, continue to simply assign them to investigators who are also working active, fresh cases and expect them to get the uh, kind of systematic review that they deserve. So Chief Martin made a significant change, a dedicated cold case unit. To have a designated unit and to have an, an approach to this particular uh, type of investigation is outstanding. It's exceptional. Fresh sets of eyes. An analytical eye is a little bit different than a detective's eyes. Our job is to take little pieces of the puzzle and take them from anywhere we can and try to make that full picture. My role is, is kind of the technology and technical advancement side, knowing about the evidence. The unit's goal, work as many cases as possible. The first step, prioritize. If something's been missed, what has not been done? What needs to be done? What can be redone? Of the Heise case, uh, that was one of the cases that was at the forefront and had recently been reviewed. Originally, we asked then-Chief Greg Williamson to reopen the brutal murder of beloved elementary school principal Kathleen Heise. Williamson then assigned the case to Detective Ken Spohr, who's since been promoted to sergeant. But the work Spore accomplished is noteworthy. Well, there was a lot of information that was uh, up front and had recently been processed. And just by using the uh, screening process, that one came up first. And so there's a lot of material in there that gives us a lot to work with. At the unit's core, two full-time detectives. It's going to be a new task and it's going to be a, a different style of investigation, so I'm excited to be a part of it. Today is Detective Abshire's first day. She's assisting Detective Chance Corner, who has been working the Heisey case for about a month. Well, I've probably interviewed 23, 24 people. Most of those people have never been interviewed before. When it comes to genealogy and familia DNA testing. The processes are in place to, to make sure that any new database that is available, any new process that is available is being looked at, being researched, and being considered for not only the Heise case, but all the cold cases. There's an opportunity that maybe that even that evidence has been submitted two, three, or four times. This might be the one time with the advancement of technology that we break the case. Do you feel that the case is solvable? I think every case is solvable, honestly. Um, some are just harder than others, and this is obviously a difficult one. Do I think it will be solved? Absolutely. I think there's... why not? We're joined now by Bakersfield Police Sergeant Ted King and Bakersfield Police Detective Christina Abshire. Thank you guys so much for being with us. So it's been a couple months since our story on the cold case unit aired. Have there been any new developments, I mean, any cold cases since that time? Uh, we are working to um, digitize all of the old reports, reports dating back to 1930s, um, and bring them all up to uh, kind of the electronic age so that the detectives can uh, read through them, query different uh, words, and apply whatever uh, investigative techniques they feel uh, is appropriate for the different cases. So, um, so that's been a huge step that we've undertaken and have been working on since the uh, implementation of this unit. Um, since then, they've uh, worked to prioritize uh, over 100 cases um, to uh, determine, you know, through assessing victimology and types of evidence and stuff like that, solvability, uh, which cases we're going to go after first. So uh, with that, there's been a lot of progress. Have there been any um, developments in any of these cases? <clears throat> well, there's uh, probably about, I don't know, 12, 12. or so. Um, top priority cases that uh, that they're jumping on right now that we believe that there's um, 
potential for significant progress in each of those cases. That's amazing. That's amazing. And the Bakersfield Police Department, you guys are the only law enforcement agency in Kern County that has a unit that's dedicated to cold cases, that has the, the resources um, and, and the personnel. How much do you think that plays into the solvability of cold cases, having the unit? It's huge. The uh, well, I, I would imagine that most of the agencies here uh, have cold cases to work on. Um, they will probably do it the way that we formally did it, where the current homicide detectives that are carrying current caseloads uh, would be responsible for those investigations. And while that's um, good, they're all good detectives and they're all focused on, on solving these crimes, the more pressing uh, newer cases take precedence because the timeliness of the evidence coming in uh, is something that we can't put aside. So a lot of times, unfortunately, those cold case homicides were pushed off. Um, now with the uh, development of this new unit, uh, Detective Abshire and her partner have the opportunity to uh, focus full time on these uh, cases and, and they've really made uh, some very good progress. And do you think that makes a, a significant difference in the chance of these cases really getting some resolution. I think it makes a huge difference because when we devote all of our time and effort into um, reviewing a single case and not having to be pulled off for a current investigation or having to f um, kind of divide up, up our attention um, between homicides in that sense, um, we can focus solely on those cases. In addition to that, it allows us to know um, and to be familiar with all other cases in that time frame because we're reviewing such a long period of time, um, we are familiar with all the cases that our department's had. And Detective Abshire, when we um, interviewed you for the cold case unit story, I think it was your first day. Since then, what has your experience been like? Um, it's been great. It's uh, been very time consuming. Um, we started with the task of 85 years worth of uh, homicides to review, and um, that's 1933 to the present. Um, it has been hours and hours of reading and looking at evidence and training. Um, our department is sending uh, everyone involved to different types of training so that we can get updated in the types of technology and the types, of the techniques that other detectives at different places, some of them having more experience and uh, already implementing those cold case units um, to find out where they're getting their success from so that we can hopefully learn and we can network with other detectives in order to get assistance in solving our cases. I'd imagine it's pretty different investigating a case that's, let's say, 40 years old versus a case that happened, you know, days ago. It's very different and sometimes very difficult. Um, I won't say it, anything is easy uh, when you're looking at a case that's 20, 30, 40 years old because you, you have the challenge of people passing away um, or people moving out of state, uh, moving, you know, areas, uh, name changes, people grow up, they get married. Um, but there are some things that um, have presented themselves a little bit easier because evidence back then um, couldn't necessarily um, be applied to the technology we have today. So if we can identify that type of evidence and bring it to the forefront and use what we have today, I think that the solvability um, goes up. Have you been able to uh, make any progress on specific cases yourself? Yes. That's exciting. That's exciting. Anything you can tell us about? In terms of progress um, overall, um, like I said, the 85 cases that we've uh, screened, um, we still have about 12 to 15 years worth of cases to go. Um, we've been able to isolate um, a, over 100 cold cases or what we consider cold cases in our um, new standard. And of those 12 that we consider high priority, um, I have myself examined evidence and started the case from the beginning but worked it in today's um, mindset. So um, we've been able to identify evidence that we're able to send over to the lab to begin the testing process. The testing process is also time consuming and so once we get to a point that um, we've started to work the cases and we've sent that evidence over, we are on a waiting game um, for a period until those results return. Right, so. right. Sergeant King, is there a definition that the department uses for a cold case? 
Yes, there is. Our, our kind of working definition of it is um, a case that is over a year old that is no longer with the detective that was assigned uh, as the lead investigator initially. Um, and has most of the uh, investigative leads have gone dry you know, for, for a number of reasons. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we'll hear from DNA analyst Garrett Sigimoto about one of the most innovative recent breakthroughs in DNA. Welcome back. Back in April, we got the incredible news that 40 years after the notorious Golden State Killer began his crime spree, an arrest had finally been made. And part of what made this news shocking and exciting was the fact that investigators had his DNA for decades, but they'd never been able to make a match since the suspect's DNA wasn't in the criminal offender database. It wasn't until investigators went out of the box and tried genealogy DNA testing that they got a match. Garrett, what exactly is uh, genealogy DNA testing? So genealogy DNA testing is essentially uh, testing family trees. So one of the tools that an individual or a genealogist can use to test uh, family trees is DNA. This is clearly um, so incredible because this is allowing investigators to identify a suspect that's outside of the criminal offender database CODIS. But there are some, you know, there's, it, there's some controversy here. Some people feel that there's some privacy violations. Are there restraints with this technology? Why isn't it being used in every case where there's DNA but a suspect hasn't yet been identified? Well, the, the main reason why it's not used in every case is because really every case doesn't have the, the right sample that can be used for the, the type of testing that they're, used, they're, they're doing for these types of cases. So um, one of the things, one requirement would be that the, the sample would have to be a really good sample that you can get a, a lot of DNA from. Um, and there has to be a single source sample. So um, it's difficult to do this type of testing on a, a sample that would have DNA from multiple contributors. And a lot of our crime scene samples do actually have DNA from multiple contributors. So um, like I said, it would be just the, the right type of sample for that case. And this type of DNA testing, it's not being done in crime labs, is that correct? That's correct. So our, our crime lab, the Kern Regional Crime Lab, does not currently do the type of testing that uh, you would do in order to uh, to test someone's genealogy. We are using conventional, what's called STR analysis. And basically what that means is we are looking at about 24 distinct locations in the DNA. Um, and you can think of DNA as a very long string of letters. What the genealogists are using is they're using uh, what are called SNPs, or single nu uh, nuclear polymorphisms and nucleotide polymorphisms. And what those are, are uh, basically looking at the individual building blocks within the DNA and those differences within the building blocks. So they're actually looking at individual differences between those single nucleotide polymorphisms. In your opinion, how, how huge is this development that we're seeing investigators using this technique? It's, it's definitely another tool that investigators can add to the toolbox. So um, obviously conventional DNA testing is still going to be the beginning and the end of, of this type of testing. So the crime lab will develop a DNA profile from a particular sample. Um, we will still attempt to upload it into the, the CODIS database first. Um, and I think this tool can be used as kind of a, an additional test when we do not get any hits in the, the CODIS database. And, and so I think as the, the databases that are used, these publicly available databases, as they are used and they're continually growing, then I think this type of testing will be uh, used more and more in the future. Do you think it's fair for the general public to feel that uh, genealogy DNA testing, that suddenly it really is possible to solve a case where you have the DNA, but that person has never been caught for um, committing a crime, so their DNA is not going to be in the criminal offender database. 
it, it basically just gives you more chances to identify the DNA from that particular case. So um, there are only a, a limited number of profiles in the offender databases or the arrestee databases that we use conventionally. And so really these additional millions of profiles that are in these uh, publicly available databases are just additional chances that, that you have to obtain hits to the DNA. It seems since we um, first heard the news about the arrest in the Golden State Killer case that we've heard about arrests in other cases where they, um, they identified the suspect using this same technology. Do you think that we're going to get to a point where this is almost the norm to catch a suspect? I think so. I think when the circumstances of the case are right and the actual DNA that is obtained from the samples from that case are right, then I think this will always be looked at by the Bakersfield Police Department and other law enforcement agencies as the next option. So I think it will in the future become the norm um, for those particular cases. And Sergeant King, there are um, several high-profile cold cases I can think of where we know that DNA was um, collected from the crime scene, but there hasn't yet been a match. Is this um, something the department is looking at for any cold cases? It is, along with emerging technologies uh, that are more um, close to home. Uh, we, we do uh, resubmit DNA samples, uh, hoping to find the contributor. I, I could imagine that that must be a very frustrating roadblock to have that DNA, but you can't get a match. So do you feel that with genealogy DNA testing, suddenly you don't have that roadblock anymore? Well, it's it's possible. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, there, it doesn't mean that um, the contributor's profile will be in the genealogy pool. Um, it could be a family member or something like that, so it requires additional investigative steps. So it's not, it's not quite as um, as much of a finish line as as it might seem on the surface. You know, there's there's still a lot of investigation that has to go in uh, before and after. Uh, it's not a magic something. fix. Correct. That's right. That's right. Okay. And are there any cases currently that the department is considering using this technology for, or rather? Are you guys in the works of doing this? We, I'd say it's safe to say that we have a couple where it's um, it's very close to consideration. There's um, some uh, traditional uh, DNA testing and uh, search databases that are going to be uh, exhausted first, and then if we still don't have anything, then we can go about trying to figure out the best way to uh, access that additional genealogy pool. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. And coming up, we're going to speak with Detective Abshire about some of the cold cases she's currently looking into. Welcome back. Now, Detective Abshire, what can you tell us about some of the cold cases you're currently investigating? One of the... Um things that has uh, presented itself in this um, new system and procedure that we're using is that um, you know, we review all the cases, um, no matter closed or open, and we do an analysis on them, and then uh, that the standard that we have uh, identifies what cases are priority or what cases have potential for um, new leads. And um, when we did the analysis initially, as we worked through the years, um, there were four cases that presented themselves from the 1978 and 79, um, from the late 70s, that presented themselves as viable um, cases where there was evidence still present that could be tested. Um, so we are currently in the process of um, reviewing those cases in depth. Uh, we have some, we have been able to um, examine all the evidence and identify or select items that have potential um, DNA on them that could be tested. Um, some of those items have been sent to the lab and we're waiting for the results. Can you give us a, a summary of one of those cases? We have a 1979 case. Um, the victim was Alice Riker, and um, she was located deceased behind a motel on Sumner Avenue. Um, that case um, went cold within about a year, I believe, and um, the evidence we've examined uh, has been, uh, has found to have been. Uh, 
I guess was preserved very well. It was still in all the original packaging. It was uh, appeared to be in very good condition. And uh, so we went through, we analyzed, um, or at least we extracted every piece of evidence that there was there and um, photographed it and prepped it in order to send to the lab. So that is a case that um, we are looking into and um, maybe potential leads. With that case and with all the cases you're looking at, is, is there anything that the public can do to help? Absolutely. Um, one of the challenges is uh, on cold cases is that a lot of time has gone by. And so we know that people's lives have changed over the years. And what may have, at the time, um, made some people reluctant to come forward, maybe to be a witness, maybe to provide information of you know things that they had heard about the case or things that they had seen, um, we're hoping that maybe people's lives have changed since then and they have a different perspective on the way things are handled today and on assisting law enforcement in providing those types of that type of information that they may possess. Um, the second thing is is that um, when people think that their information is maybe not important, it is to us. So just that little piece of information could be the one thing that we need to potentially open a case and to break it open. Um, you know, we may have DNA and not have a um, and not have a profile um, to match or not know the person that goes to it. When we spoke about genealogy, that's very important, but you know, maybe a name, a simple name on a secret witness anonymous tip line could be that one thing that breaks open that case where we're able to further our investigation and maybe create some leads. So we need the public, we need the community, we need them to contact us and feel comfortable contacting us and knowing that we're going to put every effort we have into it. I want to ask you briefly, we brought up the Golden State Killer case earlier. We've heard that um, that GSK made statements to some victims about killing people in, in Bakersfield. Can you confirm that this is something you're investigating? I would not say I'm investigating investigating um, any of those cases because no cases have presented themselves as a possible as with the Golden State Killer as a possible suspect. Um, I am uh, educated on the Golden State Killer on his methods and his time frames and his areas and um, his history and um, I can say I've gone so far as to actually consult with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department and other departments that um, were are, and currently are investigating the Golden State Killer um, and I think that um, um, as we sift through our cases and we start working those cases from bottom to top, um, if any at all present themselves as him, um, if the evidence says he's a possible suspect, we absolutely will work that. We will um, completely take that and we consider all of the cases open to any suspect, whether it's the Golden State Killer or if it was some other killer at that time frame. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Detective Abshire and Sergeant King for joining us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. If you have any information on a cold case, call the Robbery Homicide Unit at 326-3846. Now to reach Detective Abshire directly, you could call her at 326-3559. And remember, if you want to remain anonymous, you can always call the Secret Witness Hotline. That number is 322-4040. That's all for now. And for all of us here at 17 News, I'm Olivia LaVoice in for Jim Scott. Thank you for watching and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Kern County In-Depth with Jim Scott is a production of Kern Golden Empire Television. For more information on how you can contribute, simply visit KGET.com. You can also like us on Facebook and give us your feedback at Kern County In-Depth.